Well, this evening we're going to uh, pick back up and somewhat finish our look at apologetics and defending the faith against false worldviews that have developed in our day. Uh, you remember we were going through this before we had Ezra and then uh, Nathan showed the Calvinist documentary and then we got into the documentary that we've been going through against Calvinism and we finished that. Um, and I say somewhat finished because I know we talked about going through the Holy War uh, after this, but I don't know, thinking just from kind of hearing those fundamental Baptist guys talk about the rapture and tribulation and stuff as though that's just what everybody believes. That just kind of, I don't know, stirred up some things in my mind to maybe go through a brief look of eschatology. So we're going to start that um, uh, next Wednesday after, uh, obviously after tonight. Uh, but, but this evening, and like I said, somewhat finishing what we were looking at in the false worldviews, uh, we're going to be looking at atheism and agnosticism. That's the last one uh, that we're specifically covering. Uh, I chose to do these two together because though they are different, they do have a lot of the same thought that goes along with them and a lot of the same just kind of logical conclusions to where you start with and their presuppositions and so forth. And so atheism and agnosticism this evening, and just to dive right into it, uh, will be, you know, you remember I have uh, just several tenets that we'll go through. I believe I have four this evening. Uh, the first tenet uh, for uh, atheist agnosticism is a lack of belief in the true God or any gods, really. A uh, lack of belief, a lack of trust in the true God or any gods. Uh, the atheist in particular is going to reject the belief of the existence of any gods in general and certainly the monotheistic uh, view of the Christian God. Uh, just to define our terms, the prefix ah means no. If you ever hear ah before something in a word, that means no, whatever that is. Uh, ah means no, and theism comes from the Greek theos, which means God. So we're literally talking about no godism here is what atheism means. And there are different ways that different atheists will define that. Again, you'd have to speak to them and hear how they, how they want to define that. Uh, some will say that they, they, they actively affirm the non-existence of any God, while some will say that they, you know, kind of in the negative side of things, they, uh, they don't have a belief in any particular God at all. So some will actively say, no, I, I affirm the non-existence of God, but some will say, no, I don't have a belief, I don't have a trust in any particular God. But, I mean, I think when it's all said and done, it's pretty much saying the same thing. Um, but, but some of them, if, if you listen to them like on YouTube and stuff, they get really serious about how you define that. Um, and then with agnosticism, again, the prefix ah means no. Uh, and Gnosticism comes from the Greek epignosis, which means to have knowledge. Uh, so if someone is agnostic, they believe you just can't know. Uh, agnosticism is literally, uh, if you want to just define all that out, it's no knowledgeism. No knowledge, the, the belief that you can't know. Uh, no knowledgeism. An agnostic is not going to say that a god or gods do not exist, but they are going to hold that they, nor can anyone actually know for certain if they do or not. So they might, they might not. Uh, we can't know. Thus, agnosticism. No knowledgeism. And so, whether you're an atheist and saying that there is no god, or you don't believe that there is a god, um, or you're agnostic saying that we just can't know, there's obviously, in this first tenet, going to be a lack of belief in God. Uh, now, secondly, just going right along with this, is their belief in materialism. Materialism. Uh, materialism is essentially the belief that everything in the world is a different form of matter. Everything in the world is a different form of atoms and molecules. It's just a different form of the same, at its base level, physical stuff. Uh, there are no actual immaterial or non-physical existences in the world. Now, this is another form of monism. Uh, if you remember, we addressed this with the Buddhist, we addressed this with the Hindu, and even with the Norse pagan. We mentioned in Buddhism, some Buddhists are actually atheists, but many of them are also pantheistic. Uh, that everything is God. Everything is a different manifestation of God. Uh, not, there is no actual real distinctions in the world. The same as with the Hindu. Uh, everything in, in Hinduism is a different manifestation of their one God, one divine reality called Brahman. Uh, we're all just different manifestations of the same thing. And when we looked at Norse paganism and, and its roots and how they believe that existence and this world as we know it came together, 
Uh, we're just all different manifestations of the steam of Niflheim and Muspelheim, which are two different realms in Norse paganism, one a, a realm of fire, one a realm of ice, and there's a gap in between called Ganunga Gap and the steam met there, and that's when, uh, I can't remember his name, but, but this guy was made in a cow, and he spent his time drinking the cow's milk, and the cow spent her time licking a salt block, and that's how the world came in, in Norse paganism. But uh, in different ways, they all have an underlying belief that all existence is just a, a different manifestation of the same stuff. That's monism, is what that's called. So while the atheist in rejecting God definitely is not going to say the same thing that those false worldviews, those other false worldviews, uh, would say, similarly, they are saying that everything is just a different manifestation of something, of the same thing, of matter, atoms and molecules, uh, some manifestations of those atoms and molecules being more advanced uh, than others. Some can think better than others. Some can, you know, some are like humans, some are like animals, some are grass and rocks and trees and so forth. And uh, the atheist is definitely going to believe this because since they reject the concept of God, the, they reject the concept of uh, creationism. Uh, they reject that this world was specially created by a divine being. Uh, because of that, they're left with something like the Big Bang Theory or something like that, something similar in evolution. Uh, because if there is no divine creator, if there is no divine creator, then in some form or fashion, we just randomly appeared here along with all the rest of the earth and everything else in existence. And so everything that exists... It's just a, di a different manifestation of that initial matter that somehow eventually formed and evolved into the earth and animals and so on and so on and so on and so on, and now we're here. So there is nothing in the atheist worldview like God to create and to give and plant into the world an existence of an immaterial or non-physical reality, uh, like love or, uh, well, real love. That's not just a concept. Actual, real love, uh, beauty, law, logic, math, uh, a, a soul in a person. Uh, to have a person that is not just a physical thing. Canon. Son, hush. But for the agnostic, you would just have to ask them and hear, hear from their own mouth. I've never personally met an agnostic who wasn't a materialist and didn't believe in evolution uh, but again, you'll, you'll just have to ask them because the very definition of their worldview is that they don't know. So, you know, who knows what, th there may be an agnostic out there that doesn't uh, support that. Uh, but under this heading, I did want to mention one of the modern consequences of materialism uh, in our culture today. Because though many professing Christians may reject atheism and materialism on paper, right, and just check the box off and say, no, I don't affirm that, that's not true. In practice, there are aspects of many professing Christians' life in which they do think like a materialist. Uh, think of modern psychiatry today, and just as culture-wide and, and even much of a contemporary church culture-wide acceptance of many things that are deemed by the world as, as mental illnesses today. Uh, well, first of all, from a biblical standpoint, that logically doesn't make any sense. Uh, from, from a biblical standpoint, there is no such thing as a mental illness. Uh, because, beloved, our mind is an immaterial part of us. Our mind is a part of our soul that does not catch sicknesses like our body. Our soul doesn't just catch something like that. It doesn't just come upon it and it becomes sick like that. Uh, in God's world, we are body and soul, and our physical bodies get sick. Our physical bodies get uh, ill, and we treat them with physical means. But when we have spiritual problems in the mind... For example, depression, anxiety, unrighteous anger, so forth. Uh, we don't treat them the same way we do with a physical illness. There's not a, a pill that we take. There's not a physical means to cure a, a spiritual uh, problem. God gives us spiritual means to treat spiritual problems. For example, repentance, confession, prayer, uh, being amongst the church, his means of grace, the preaching of the word, the reading of the word, and so forth. He gives us spiritual means to treat spiritual problems, and he gives us physical means to treat physical problems. But since modern psychiatry comes from a godless and materialistic worldview, a worldview that rejects God, uh, they uh, then see us as no different than anything else in this world. We're just evolved animals, 
and that worldview. Uh, we don't actually have a soul given to us by God. And thus, since we are nothing but physical, any problem that we have, even if it is what we would deem a spiritual problem, any problem that we have then uh, and their worldview must, be, must then be treated physically. It must be treated physically. So everyone with spiritual problems then gets pumped full of pills instead of actually dealing with those problems the way God would reveal and define in his word of truth. And Christians everywhere have been taken captive by this. I've been taken captive by this before coming to a biblical uh, view of this. But Christians everywhere have. I mean, an example, their child keeps act acting up and instead of seeking to analyze whether they're parenting or not in a godly way and instead of discipling and disciplining their child in obedience to Christ, instead of spanking the child, Proverbs twenty two fifteen says, folly is bound up in the heart of the child and the rod of discipline drives it far away from him. Instead of using God's means, what do they do? They blame up a made up a, a, a disease. They blame a worldly made up disease in the child and they pump them full of drugs. They pump them full of pills. And they say, well, it's, it's just because you have a sickness that you're this way. And they need to repent. Because instead of being taken captive by Christ, they've been taken captive by a godless, materialistic worldview that says we're all just physical things with no soul. And since we have no soul, this is really the only thing we got for you. Uh, no hope. You're going to be like this the rest of your life. And an excuse for uh, every time your child acts up. Well, it's not really him. It's not really his fault. It's just disease that he has. That's not true. That's not true. It is, it is the child, and the child needs to repent, and parents need to repent and parent their child in the way that God has designed them to. But materialism, everything is physical. Everything in the world is physical. There is no immaterial whatsoever. Thirdly, and uh, this going along with their materialism, most atheists and agnostics are going to be empiricists. Empiricists. An empiricist is someone who believes that all knowledge is derived from our sense experience. Uh, I have to see it and test it to believe it. That's essentially empiricism. I have to experience it to believe it. And, you know, that's just something that many people do today without even knowing the term. Many people today are empiricists. They just don't know the term. They don't know that they're empiricists. But a lot of people today base what they know because of what they have experienced in their life. That's, that's what that is. I have to see it to believe it. That's empiricism. And it really stems from this unbiblical presupposition that knowledge in the world is neutral. That knowledge is neutral. Knowledge is just out there in the world. You don't need a transcendent God to give truth to us. Truth is just out there. We just need to go out there and get it. I just need to go out there and grab it. Um, so... You know, really just forget the fact that people experience things differently. Forget the fact that people can certainly be wrong at times and experience things wrongly, can see things wrongly, because, well, experience tells me the truth. I know what I know to be true because I've seen it. I've seen it. I believe it. I experienced this is true. You may not accept that, but it's true. I went through it. That's empiricism. And then fourthly and lastly, a rejection of real purpose and absolute morality. And that, that's just a logical conclusion from their starting place. A rejection of real purpose and absolute morality. Purpose in this worldview really comes down to you creating your own purpose. It really comes down to you creating your own purpose. Purpose comes from you. Hey, I'm just doing what's right for me. I'm just doing what's right for me and mine. I'm just doing what makes me happy. Right? You hear a lot of that today. Do what makes you happy. Do what's best for you. Right? Why? Because there is no creator God that gives me purpose. There is no creator God that tells me what should make me happy. I make that up for myself. Now, they may not say it this way, but we're just, in their worldview, we're just meat bags of evolved bacteria, millions of years from bacteria to fish to monkeys to us. And so obviously there is no real purpose at all. We're just random accidents that happened in this huge universe that we live in. We're just random accidents in a universe that doesn't care about us at all. No ultimate purpose, no real purpose, and thus also no absolute morality. There is no creator God who says what is right and what is wrong. Uh, who, who says for his creations, this you shall do, this you shall not do. This is good for you, this is not good for you. Uh, we're just cosmic accidents. So what we know as morality are just concepts, just ideas, figments of the imagination that we've come up with in the human race for what we in our own opinion, think is the good of mankind. And 
That is why as the culture has become more atheistic and more agnostic in its thinking, there has been a sharp decline and change in morality. Because if we ultimately choose morality, then we're always going to choose that which makes us more comfortable. And apart from Christ, what makes us more comfortable than our sin? Nothing. And so certainly as the culture becomes more atheistic, agnostic in its thinking, uh, the acceptance of sin is going to rise because that's what makes us more comfortable. The acceptance of doing what makes you happy and creating your own purpose is going to become more acceptable because we've rejected the God who gives us purpose. We've, we've rejected the God who gives us ethics and morality. So that's the, that's the four tenets I got there for atheism and agnosticism. A lack of belief in God or God's. Uh, materialism, empiricism, and a rejection of real purpose and absolute morality. Now, uh, just going back through this, as we have in the other worldviews, uh, what do we say back to this? Right, those are the claims. What do we say back to this? To the atheist, to the agnostic. Well, we do exactly what Proverbs 26, verse 4 to 5 says. And we answer them according to their folly. We answer them according to their foolishness, lest they be wise in their own eyes. And we do so not to just tear them down and make them look foolish, as they are, for believing such things. But we do so to bring them the truth that they know as God's image bearers, truth that they are suppressing, that by God's grace they would glorify him in repentance and cling to Christ. We want them to be saved. We want them to quit suppressing the truth. We want them to love the truth. We want them to glorify God in accordance with his grace. Certainly they're going to glorify God uh, regardless. He's going to get glory even in his wrath and justice. But we want, we want them, we desire for them, for, for love for our neighbor, love for truth, love for God, to glorify him for his grace. So, firstly, to the agnostic who says you can't know, I want to know, this is just, you know, what you could bring forward to them. I'm not, I'm not bringing forward everything you could bring forward to them. But, firstly, I want to know, on the basis that you can't know, which is what they're saying, on the basis that you can't know, how can you know anything at all? In, in your worldview, how can you actually know anything with certainty? How can you say this is that, this is not that? and so forth. This is right, this is wrong. How can you know if your whole worldview is based on this idea that you can't know? And certainly they may respond that, well, I'm not saying that you can't know things. I'm just saying whether or not there's a God or not. I'm just saying you can't know whether there's a God or not and how we were created and so forth. But that kind of thinking really stems from this false thinking again. I brought this up earlier that knowledge is neutral and that we can just go out there and grab it. And it's just, it's just a, knowledge is just a free-for-all for everyone. Knowledge is neutral, and that whether there is a God or not really doesn't affect life as we know it. Uh, but it does. Uh, what if a God... I mean, you're saying we don't know, and you're saying that, that we just don't know um, if there is a God or who this God is and why he created and so forth. What if the God who created this world purpose for our life to be lived out in a totally different way than we think is okay? What if he did? What, what if he purposed that our life would be lived out in a totally different way than the culture thinks is okay according to the cultural norms? What if the God who created this world said that 2 plus 2 can be 5 sometimes, or that contradictions are okay, or that there is no such thing as beauty or love or morals? Uh, what if he said that you shouldn't eat certain foods, etc., etc., etc.? I'm just saying, where we come from, and why we're here is very important because that establishes and forms the foundation for who we are and why we live our life. So if you can't know, you are literally saying you can't know anything. If I can't know why I'm here and why I've been created, then I can't know everything else that, that necessarily stems and, and flows out of that. If you can't know that there's a God or who, or who they might be, then you literally can't know anything because the very basis for everything else is I don't know. It's all a big question mark. You know, is this right to do? I don't know. Um, that is purely a worldview of uncertainty and should be completely rejected. It's just absolutely absurd. Uh, it, it gives you no certainty at all. It gives you no foundation to say, you shouldn't hurt this person. You shouldn't lie to this person. You shouldn't do wrong to this person. Or that you should do right to this person. It gives you no foundation for anything. So, uh, Mr. Agnostic, come to Christ. Mr. Agnostic, come to him in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, which is Christ Jesus, Colossians 2, 3, and him who not only saves your soul for eternity, but who saves your mind to think rightly as his creation. Mr. Agnostic, quit saying you don't know when you don't live that way. You certainly don't live as though you don't know. 
someone kills your friend or family member, you're not going to be saying that you don't know them. You're going to be crying out for justice to be done because you know that God is. Quit suppressing the truth you know. And by the grace of God, repent and trust Christ. Maybe the agnostic would say, well, you know, I know that it's wrong to kill, and, and I know that because, you know, I can see the pain and the hurt that it brings. So, so we as a, as a society, or me, just me by myself, I, I can say for certain that it's wrong to kill because I can see the pain and the hurt that it brings. Well, again, I would go back to, but why is pain and hurt wrong in your worldview if you don't know? Why is pain a bad thing? Why is hurt a bad thing if you can't know? And this is also getting into the empiricism shared by both agnostics and the atheists, which just looking at this in general, any purely empirical worldview is purely subjective. Right? That's by definition. It's somebody's own opinion. It's how you're perceiving things. It's how you're seeing it. It's how you're analyzing it. Uh, I experience this. I see, therefore I know. And so you, know, you can also get into this from the standpoint of, but how do you know that your experience is right? You, you've experienced that pain and hurt are wrong, but how do you know that your experience of pain and hurt are wrong is a right experience? How do you know that you've experienced that in the right way? Have you always experienced everything in your life rightly? Does what you know from your experiences always declare what is true for everyone across the board? Is, does your experience always say what is true across the board for everyone in existence? So how do you know that your experience of pain and hurt is bad is a right experience? On, on what basis, by what standard is your experience right? Because there are people in this world that are okay with pain and hurt and murdering people. So who decides who is right then? Perhaps they would move outside of just themselves and they, perhaps they go to, well, the society. Well, the society says, the culture says. Uh, the society as a whole declares what is right and wrong, which... You know, I would mention them were getting into their understanding that morals are just concepts. They're not actually universal truths. Uh, but you can look at other fallen societies and see the foolishness of such an idea. You can look at Nazi Germany. Right? They decided that it was okay to kill Jews and homosexuals and so forth. Um, certainly that person would say that that society was wrong, but I thought it was the society's prerogative to do so. So why should you say that that society is wrong when it is the society's decision to do it? And really all we're looking at is societies is what? Just, just, it, it's not just the opinion of one man, but it's still the opinions of people who don't experience things rightly, who can be wrong. It's just a collective whole of that. So it's still subjective. They're, they're simply groups of individual people basing things off their experiences collectively. So we can't say that anything is certainly true by our own experience. Uh, empiricism falls drastically short. We would either have to experience and see everything in all of existence in the right way to really know any one thing to be true in this world uh, because what we don't know and what we, I've said it several times before, but what we don't know and what we, uh, what we haven't experienced rightly could very well contradict what we think we know in accordance with our experience. Right? I think I know something because I've experienced, but do you know all things? No. Well, what you, what you don't know, what you haven't experienced, could that not very well contradict what you think you know? Well, yes. And so to know one thing, you would have to know all things and experience them rightly, or you would have to have truth revealed to you by the one who does know all things, because he has ordained all things, and that is the Christian world, uh, that the Lord God has revealed truth to us. Uh, truth has been objectively revealed to us from outside of us. It's, it's not uh, decided by our imaginations. It's not decided by our opinion, by empiricism, uh, truth is revealed to us by our God through his word. And that's why we can always know things to be true regardless of our experience. I can experience something and I can know how to interpret that experience by what the truth tells me, not by how I feel. Church, the empiricist needs to come to Christ who gives us the only true and consistent worldview through which we can ever rightly interpret our experiences. Because it comes from the God who created us and gives us our experiences to begin with. To mention as well, empiricism at its core, when you just look at the thought itself, empiricism at its core just implodes on itself. Because if someone says that they will only believe what they see and experience, you can very quickly point out the absurdity of such a belief uh, with this statement. Did you see and experience your belief that you must see and experience something to believe it? 
You get what I'm saying? They're saying, I believe that I must see and experience something to believe it. But did you see that thought that you believe? To see and experience everything? No, you didn't see it. You can't see it. It's a thought. It's immaterial. You can't see that. It just implodes on itself. It's an immaterial thought that you can't see nor test, which would mean in accordance with your own worldview, you shouldn't believe what you say you believe. Because you'll only believe what you see, and you can't see that. So you shouldn't believe in period that, that the worldview implodes on itself. You shouldn't believe it in accordance with its own, uh, what it's saying. And it shows the absurdity of such a position that should be rejected. It's, it's subjective and it implodes on itself. It's just as what Romans 1 says, uh, that since they do not seek to honor God, they become futile in their thinking, uh, just as all worldviews that reject God. Uh, then looking at their materialism, right? This is just another manifestation of, of futile and foolish thinking that comes about when we reject God. As I mentioned before, this is just another version of monism that we looked at with the other false worldviews. And so everything that we've said before, if you were with us then, um, with the Buddhist, with the Hindu, with the Norse pagan, can be said here. Let's to kind of sum that up. If there really are no distinction in this world and everything is just another manifestation of the same thing, uh, for example, in this case, in atheism and uh, agnosticism, or speaking of materialism, uh, if everything is just another manifestation of matter, atoms and molecules just grown or evolved into different degrees and forms, uh, really, you know, we're really no different than, than this. We're just a different manifestation of this. Uh, but it's, we're all the same stuff. Grass, everything. The fans, um, everything in the world. If that's true, and there are no distinctions then how can I then make distinctions by saying that certain things are good and certain things are bad? If there are no distinctions in this world and everything in this world is just the same stuff, just a different manifestation of it, and there really is no distinction, how can I then make distinctions and say some manifestations of that same stuff are bad and other manifestations of that same stuff are, are good? Some are non-desirable and some are desirable. Some are correct. Some are wrong. Uh, if everything is the same then I have no basis to do that at all. There are no distinctions to be made in a, distinction, a distinctionless world. You can't make distinctions in a world that has no distinctions. Uh, we just have just experiences and circumstances to be had of different manifestations of the same matter. Furthermore, in this worldview, we need to understand that if there is no such thing as the immaterial, if there is no such thing as a non-physical existence in the world, then as we mentioned earlier, uh, somewhat briefly, natural universal laws in this world of any sort don't actually exist. Any kind of immaterial law doesn't exist at all. They're just basically concepts that we've developed to better live our purposeless life out. So laws like laws of logic and the law of non-contradiction, right? That I can't be in here and out there at the same time. That two plus two can't be four and five the same, so forth. Um, you know, my car can't be outside and in here at the same time. We, we can't have contradictions, right? We don't accept that as human. That's a universal law. Um, laws like that are laws like math that I mentioned before. Two plus two is always four. Three minus one is always two. Those can't actually exist in a world where there is nothing but the physical and, and there's nothing actually that's immaterial in existence. Uh, in such a worldview, to be consistent, really... Uh, there would be nothing wrong with contradictions. There'd be nothing wrong with contradictions at all. They're just concepts. They're just ideas, but they're not laws. It doesn't have to be that way. I could contradict myself. I could lie, and, and there wouldn't be a problem with that at all. And there would be nothing wrong with saying that 2 plus 2 is 5, or could be 7 at some times, because in that worldview, those things are just concepts that we've come up with. But they're not actually laws. They're not unchanging truths that are universal, that are the same everywhere, no matter where you go. Now, to be certain, they are those things. They are true. They are universal. They are laws unchanging. Because laws of logic and math are simply reflections of the way that God thinks. God is universal. God is unchanging. So they are, they're, they are manifestations, uh, reflections of the way that God thinks. They're reflections of his character. God is not a God of confusion, so there is harmony in how we are to think as his image bearers which is why, even though their worldview would logically conclude the opposite, they would never think that way when it comes to things that actually affect them personally. Now, yeah, they'll say 
these kind of things all day when they don't affect them. They'll say, oh, they're just concepts and things like that. They, they can say that all day long. But when it comes to things that actually affect them, you can see that they don't actually believe that, that they're suppressing the truth that they know by their unrighteousness. For example, they wouldn't be okay with their bank teller telling them that they have $30 in the bank when they really have $3 million. Right? They wouldn't be okay with that. Uh, well, sir, these are just concepts. What do you mean? You thought you actually had $3 million? We say you have 30 Right? That's a concept for you. It's a concept for us. So we say you have 30. I know you say 3 million, but hey, right? They're just ideas. They're not universal. They're not, they're not unchanging. Uh, 2 plus 2 can be 5 sometimes, remember? So sometimes 3 million can be, can be 30. You got 30 bucks, sir. No, they, they wouldn't take that. They would then demand that numbers are not just concepts, and their 3 million really means 3 million. Because they're created in God's image and they're suppressing the truth they know with a foolish worldview that doesn't comport with the reality they live in. Also with morality comes the same thing. Morality, you know, the laws of morality, laws of ethics, those would be just a concept. To go back to the bank analogy, Mr. Atheist would certainly demand justice for getting his money back. But if morality is just a concept, what's the big deal? Who cares that they took that much money from you? Ultimately, what does it matter? It's just an idea. It's just a concept. If there is no transcendent universal ethic, and morality is just a concept, it's just an idea, then why seek to hold people to it? Why seek to hold people to just an opinion? Just something that came from the imagination of men that isn't actually true. Well, they would because they're made in the image of God and they can't escape it. They can't escape it. They're suppressing the truth by unrighteousness and they need to repent and believe upon Christ to be reconciled to God and to actually think rightly uh, and wisely in his world as his creation. And you think about it, to be consistent, if atheism were true, then there shouldn't be a justice system, and there shouldn't even be schools or anything such as it's called learning. Because if we're just matter, right, everything is just a concept and it's not actually real. So why hold people to that? Why have a justice system? Why actually learn anything if anything is not actually real? And not only that, not, not only is everything just a concept and not actually real, but they're just physical chemical reactions in the brain. And who has ever said that a mere chemical reaction was ever good or bad? Who has ever said that just a, because there is no immaterial. We're just physical things that are having chemical reactions that are, that are going. A chemical reaction is all moral, right? All means no. It's not moral. A chemical reaction is just a chemical reaction. It's not right or wrong or good or bad or anything like that. You know, you've seen people take uh, you know, a Coke bottle and they put Mentos in it. Do you say Mentos? Or, you say Mentos? Mentos. Um, they put, they put Mentos in it in a Coke bottle, take a Pepsi one, you put it in. Which, which one is right and which one is wrong? Which fuzz, fizz out of that is right and wrong? You know, which one would you say? You wouldn't, right? That's just ridiculous. It's, but, but it's the same way. If, if all we're doing is just fit, having physical chemical reactions in the brain and I'm not actually making real decisions in accordance with the mind and an immaterial soul that I have, and I'm just fizzing in the brain and doing things, why would you hold me... Uh, accountable for that. Why would there be a justice system? Why would I need to learn anything? If my thinking is just mere chemical reactions in the brain, then I should never trust a single thought I have. Why would I learn? Why would I seek to remember anything? If it's just a, a physical chemical reaction. Uh, because it's not really me thinking it. It just, it just happened. It just, it just kind of happened. I didn't, I didn't cause it. I'm not uh, the one who, who, who made it happen, who chose to make it happen. It just happened. And then furthermore, going along with this, if, if we're just matter in motion with no ultimate divine guidance from anything, then how can I ever be confident that the future will be like the past? Um, if all things in the world are just manifestations of matter randomly moving around in the world with no real guidance, then why would I seek to learn anything? Because how something in the past would not necessarily have any bearing on how it acts in the future. Uh, for example... If atheism were true, then how could I ever trust my pharmacist that those certain ingredients will always come together to form the same kind of medicine? Those same ingredients. Or, I mean, the same ingredients to form Coke or a cheeseburger or whatever, uh, toothpaste. Um, how, how could I ever trust that those same ingredients will always stay that same way? They won't break down in some way. They won't change in some way. So when I put them together, how do I know it won't kill me? How do I, how do I know it won't taste the same? How could I ever... Trust that. How could I ever have a justification for that if I'm living in a, in a world that has no guidance whatsoever and everything just big banged out of nowhere and it's just random? <clears throat> well, I couldn't. I couldn't trust anything. 
And it's amazing that so many people try to pit science against the Bible when science, the action of learning, the act of having knowledge, science is dependent upon the uniformity of nature. Uh, that there is a way that this world functions and is consistent and uniform. And the only way we can have that justification is through the worldview that Scripture gives us. Uh, what does Hebrews 1.3 say? That Jesus Christ, the God in the flesh, upholds the universe by the word of his power. Well, what is his power? Is it consistent? Yeah, it's consistent. It's, he, he's unchanging. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Romans 1, 19 to 20 uh, tells us that God's invisible attributes are put on display through the created order, through creation. Um, Jeremiah 33. Let me read this. Jeremiah 33, verse 25 to 26. Thus says the Lord, if I have not established my covenant with day and night and the fixed order of heaven and earth, if I haven't established that, then I will reject the offspring of Jacob and David, my servant, and will not choose one of his offspring to rule over the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will restore their fortunes and will have mercy on them. So here's a question. Will God reject the offspring of Jacob and David, his servant? Is he going to reject Christ, his son? Is he going to reject that one rules over the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? No. He's supremely shown that in Christ Jesus. He, he, he's on the throne of David. He reigns over the people of God forever. So he's not going to reject the covenant he's made with day and night, the fixed order of heaven and earth. He upholds the universe by the word of his consistent power. Therefore, I can know that things in this world will act consistently because that reflects something of who God is. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Science, learning, comes from the Christian worldview because God gives us a basis for science and a basis for knowledge in his word. But atheism and materialism do no such thing. A, a godless, random, physical universe gives us nothing whatsoever to ever believe that the future will be like the past. Uh, if I literally believe that worldview, I should be walking around in fear that, I'm gonna, that gravity is going to fly me off the world or something. Uh, but I'm not doing that because I know that God is. Well, I, I mean, I, I accept his word, but they're not doing that either because they know that God is. Uh, Mr. Materialist, come to Christ. Quit thinking foolishly. Quit rejecting knowledge. Come to the fear of the Lord. Cling to Christ our God. Cling to Christ our, our great God and Savior who lived, died, and who rose again that we would be reconciled to God and able to think rightly in his world. Quit suppressing the truth and accept it. Come to the truth of God. Come to the truth and think rightly and, and wisely in God's world. And then lastly, to mention the fact that they will say and... They have to say this because of their atheism and materialism, that there, there's no real purpose in this life. To mention the fact that they'll say there's no real purpose, that we just create that ourselves. Here's the thing. If there is no real purpose, then why do they act like there's purpose? If there is no real purpose, why do they act like there's purpose? If there is no real purpose, then why do they love their spouse? Why do they love their kids? Why do they love their friends? Why do they care for anything in a purposeless universe that doesn't care about them whatsoever, with no reason to care? Why? Well, I don't, I don't know what they would specifically say to that, but the reason they do it, as I've said many times this evening, is because they're created in the image of God, and though they foolishly say there's no purpose, they know that there is. They know that there is, but they're rejecting that because of their love of unrighteousness. They need Christ. And we need to lead them to him, brothers and sisters. We need to share the gospel with them. We need to show them how their worldview is absurd and foolish and lead them to the Savior who gives them the only correct and consistent worldview existing in all of existence because it's the only right worldview of all of existence. It comes from the God who created existence itself. It's the truth. Uh, we need to lead them and tell them of the way, the truth, and the life. Beloved, because apart from that, they will stay in their ridiculousness and foolishness and sinful way of mind and life to find destruction at the end under the wrath of God. We don't want them to have that. And may we give them the truth that God by his grace would give them a new heart, take out the heart of stone, and give them a heart of flesh. Well, that concludes our look at atheism and agnosticism. And like I said, um, next week we'll begin a look at uh, a brief, you know, kind of overview and look, probably about 12 weeks. I don't know if you call that brief or not, but whatever. Um, 
look at uh, eschatology and last things. Um, I pray that this has helped and equipped you to make a better defense of your faith, a better apologia, a better defense of the faith. Um, and apart from any comments or questions, we can conclude in prayer.